What is going on, lovely people? This is Medicosis Perfectionatus, where medicine makes perfect sense. Welcome back to my biochemistry playlist, which so far has more than 150 videos. In previous videos, we talked about mitochondrial disorders, Marfan syndrome, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, osteogenesis imperfecta, phenylketonuria, tyrosinemia, albinism, maple syrup urine disease, and then we started talking about porphyrias. We talked about porphyria cutanea tarda. Cutanea means cutaneous skin which has photosensitivity. We also talked about congenital erythropoietic porphyria, and today we'll talk about the third famous porphyria, which is acute intermittent porphyria. Acute attacks of abdominal pain, neuropsychiatric issues, peripheral neuropathy, autonomic instability like tachycardia hypertension, and during the acute attack, the urine can turn purple when oxidized. In fact, the word porphyria came from the Greek for purple, so smash that like button and let's get started. This video belongs to my biochemistry playlist. If you just want the diseases, check out my clinical biochemistry playlist. I have two stories about acute intermittent porphyria for you. Listen carefully because you might be the only doctor in the entire country who diagnoses this disease. It is very commonly misdiagnosed and missed. So here's the story. This was a normal female. Everything was hunky-dory. She was living the life. Then for some odd reason, she started having acute episodes of severe abdominal pain. It was so severe that every time she goes to the hospital, the surgeon opens her belly up because the pain was unbearable. And every time they open her belly up, they found nothing abnormal. And then she becomes normal again. Later, the acute attack comes. She goes to the hospital. No one knows what's going on. So they open her up. Nothing abnormal. Then the acute attack subsides and she gets normal again until the next attack. And if that was not bad enough, she started literally going mad, just like the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche who succumbed to madness in Turin. Although, unlike Nietzsche, who had the psychiatric issues because of tertiary syphilis, this lady had acute intermittent porphyria. She started going crazy and no one could help her she ended up in a psychiatric hospital until a medical student, for heaven's sake, came by. Actually performed a full physical exam, which is very rare in a psychiatric hospital, and saw this multiple incisions in the belly. What? And the history says that she used to be okay and normal, and now she has psychiatric issues. So he remembered something. Oh, I've heard of acute intermittent porphyria before, but how can I diagnose it? No one will believe me. If I ask the older doctor to order some sophisticated test, they will laugh at me. Porphyria, my gluteus maximus, get out of here. When I was your age, I could never talk to my superiors like this. Have some respect for yourself. So the students decided to take matter in his own hands and said, okay, what's the cheapest test possible? Urine sample. So he collected a urine sample and then waited and exposed that urine sample to light. It turned purple during the acute episode. The diagnosis was later confirmed by an enzyme assay. And just by giving some glucose and hemin and maybe replace the deficient enzyme, the patient became completely normal and left the psychiatric hospital. What? Is that even possible? Yes, indeed. If you stop and think, please do not be another doofus with a stethoscope. We have enough of those already. This lecture might help you save a patient's life. That was story number one. Story number two from the movie The Madness of King George. King George probably, arguably, according to the legend, had acute intermittent porphyria. He had acute bouts and attacks of madness. And the only person who could predict those episodes was his servant. How come? In those good old days which were not so good, running water was replaced by running servants. So, who was next to the king when he was doing stuff in the bathroom? This servant noticed that every time the king has those acute episodes of craziness, his urine turns purple. So the servant decided to take advantage of King George and make him sign some papers that he would not sign if he was sane. So the servant tricked the king many times by getting his signature using his signet ring, not to be confused with the signet ring of your patient's fatty liver. Can you name a cancer that has signet ring cell? Let me know your answer in the comments. These are the stories of acute intermittent porphyria. 
acute intermittent episodes of abdominal pain, autonomic dysfunction, neuropsychiatric issues, and peripheral neuropathy. And don't forget that the urine turns purple because the word of porphyria means purple. Who else is gonna teach you like this? Your lovely professor with his PowerPoint? Give me a break. In previous videos, we talked about amino acid derivatives. Amino acids come from what? From protein digestion. Amino acids are the building blocks for protein. How about the protein globin, which makes my hemoglobin? Yes, indeed, it also has amino acids. Why do we call them amino acids? Because we have an amino group and a carboxylic acid group. Amino acid. Amino acids in your body are many, way more than 20. The proteogenic amino acids that incorporates into protein and are coded by your genetic codon are only 20. However, these are not the only amino acids in your body because your body has others. Non-proteogenic amino acids that are not coded for by your codons and not incorporated into protein, such as these, and we'll talk about ornithine, in the next video with urea cycle. What is an ornithologist? Comment below. You see those 20 proteogenic amino acids? Just, I just want you to focus on glycine. Glycine, abbreviated as GLY or simply G. Why do we care about glycine so much? Glycine combines with succinyl-CoA under B6 influence to give us protoporphyrin. Protoporphyrin combines with the ferrous iron to give us heme. Heme combines with globin to give you hemoglobin, which is incorporated inside your red blood cell. Protoporphyrin is a primitive porphyrin. It's one of the porphyrins. What is a porphyrin? It's a big heterocyclic macrocycle organic compound, and it has four pyrrole rings. Let's just draw this. It does not have to be accurate because I don't care that much about chemistry. And here is one, and here is one, and then we connect them like this. And of course, we have lots of nitrogens inside, and this is four pyrrole rings. Together they give us the compound known as porphyrin. And because we have double bonds here, like lots of them, we call this conjugation in organic chemistry because it's caused by purity. What do you mean by purity? I mean pure unhybridized p orbital. This makes this molecule very good at absorbing the electromagnetic spectrum. Which part? The visible light. And that's why they are deeply colorful. In this case, they are purple because the word porphyria means purple. If you remember my video on bilirubin and jaundice, we talked about the opposite story. Let's break down the red blood cells into hemoglobin. Hemoglobin gets broken down into heme and globin. Globin is a bunch of amino acids. Heme is made of iron and protoporphyrin. So protoporphyrin plus iron will give us heme. Porphyria is a problem here, which means the defect is in the heme synthesis pathway. In the red blood cells, there is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is made of heme and globin. The heme is made from succinyl-CoA and glycine. Thank you, vitamin B6, for your help. Where have I heard of succinyl-CoA before? It's in the Krebs cycle. Acute intermittent porphyria is an autosomal dominant disease, which is slightly odd. Let me tell you why. Genetic diseases, the patterns of inheritance, are autosomal or sex-linked or X-linked. And those are called Mendelian patterns. Do we have other genetic diseases that do not follow a Mendelian pattern? Yes, indeed, and we call those multifactorial inheritance. But the Mendelian ones are autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, X-linked dominant, or X-linked recessive. If the patient has enzyme deficiency and his parents are closely related, or he lives in a community that marries only within one another and it's a very tight-knit, tiny community, then consanguinity increases the risk of autosomal recessive disease. Okay, so when I see enzyme deficiency, I should suspect autosomal recessive. But there are two exceptions to this rule. I can have autosomal dominant disease with enzyme deficiency, which is odd because usually autosomal dominant, no consanguinity and no enzyme deficiency. But I can have autosomal dominant caused by enzyme deficiency, yes indeed. And these are some diseases, these two are very important for your exam. Acute intermittent porphyria is autosomal dominant and there is an enzyme deficiency. And hereditary angioedema is also autosomal dominant and there is enzyme deficiency. Do you want a third one? How about porphyria cutanea tarda? another porphyria that's mostly autosomal dominant. However, the congenital erythropoietic porphyria is autosomal recessive. It follows the rule of enzyme deficiency, autosomal recessive. Today's topic, acute intermittent porphyria, is autosomal dominant. Let's say that mommy is uh, uppercase A, lowercase A, and daddy is lowercase A, lowercase A. Let's do my Punnett square. This is fun. Big A, small A, small A, small A. 
big A, small A, small A, small A. Okay, how many people here are sick? Well, since this is autosomal dominant disease, the bad gene has to be the uppercase, and the normal one has to be the lowercase, okay? Uppercase, and this dominates over this, so this patient is sick. This dominates over this, so this patient is also sick. So I have uh, two sick patients out of four possibilities, which means about half of the offsprings will be affected with this disease. That's autosomal dominant. Lucky for us, acute intermittent porphyria is autosomal dominant, but with low penetrance. The disease is not so good at penetrating through generation after generation. Acute intermittent porphyria, just like congenital erythropoogenic porphyria and porphyria cutanea torta, is another defect in the heme synthesis pathway. What's the heme synthesis pathway? Basically, we're trying to make heme. Heme synthesis, amazing. Why are you trying to make heme? So that I can combine it with globin and make hemoglobin in the red blood cell to carry oxygen to the tissue. Okay, how do you make heme? Iron and protoporphyrin. And what's the name of the doozy enzyme that does this? Well, iron is ferro. Oh, ferrous ferrochelatase, it's chelation of iron, removal of iron from the system by putting it into some pathway to give us something useful. Otherwise, this iron will float around, it can give me iron constellations in sideroblasts, we call this sideroblastic anemia, in fact, the word sidero means iron, literally, does anyone remember hemosiderosis? Okay, got you, so we make protoporphyrin, and then we combine it with iron to make heme, and then combine it with globin to make hemoglobin. Okay, how do we make protoporphyrin? Let's start at the beginning. The simplest amino acid is glycine. Combine this with succinyl-CoA, which is also in the TCA cycle, to give us delta ALA, delta aminolivulinic acid. Look at this, amino, because this is an amino acid. Amino acid, it makes sense. What's the name of the enzyme that made ALA? Well, it's ALA synthase, delta amino livulinic acid synthase enzyme. Amazing, and we require vitamin B6 as a cofactor. This is the rate limiting enzyme or rate determining step. What does that mean? It means this is the slowest step, which means the rate of the entire reaction is dependent on the slowest step. Even if everything later is super duper fast, you have to wait until you make ALA. We are dependent on the delta ALA synthase. This is the rate limiting step. And because it's the rate limiting step, it's the most important step and heavily regulated. Suppose that I have tons of heme around already. I successfully made enough heme. Should I make more? Oh no, why would you make more if you have enough? Therefore, this heme will go here and by negative feedback, inhibit the delta ALA synthase. This is regulation. Moreover, let's say that I am well fed. I have tons of glucose in the body. Then succinyl-CoA better go to the TCA cycle in order to burn that sugar and give me energy and not waste my time here in making heme. So heme and glucose inhibit delta ALA synthase. But what stimulates delta ALA synthase? Any P450 enzyme inhibitor. This is a microsomal liver enzyme. What are the cytochrome P450 enzyme inducers? We have phenytoin, carbamazepine, so anti epileptic drugs. We have rifampin, barbiturates. Barbiturates are sedatives and hypnotics. Chronic alcohol use is a cytochrome P450 inducer but acute alcohol use is a B450 inhibitor. The acute with the T is an inhibitor with the T, but the chronic alcohol with an N is an inducer with an N. We also have graziovolvin, maybe glucocorticoids, efavirenz, nevirapine, St. John's wort, etc. All of these do what? They stimulate and induce cytochrome P450, which induces the delta ALA synthase. When you stimulate delta ALA synthase, you will make more delta ALA. Okay, after this, what else? Well, after you make delta ALA, you can convert this into porphobilinogen. Remember my bilirubin story. When we break down hemoglobin, you get what? Eventually get bilinogen. Who converted bilirubin into bilinogen? The gut bacteria. What's the name of the enzyme that converted ALA into porphobilinogen? Delta ALA dehydratase. Next, we have porphobilinogen, which will be converted into hydroxymethylbilane. By the famous enzyme porphobilinogen deaminase, formerly known as uroporphyrinogen 1 synthase. And this porphobilinogen deaminase, which deaminates the porphobilinogen, i.e. removes an amino, 
is the enzyme deficient in the disease known as acute intermittent porphyria. The rest of the enzymes were discussed in previous videos in this biochemistry playlist. So, we're talking about acute intermittent porphyria. Yep, what do you have? I have an autosomal dominant disease and I have deficiency in this porphobilinogen deaminase. Okay, when I have defect here, anything above it or proximal to it or before it will go up but anything after it will go down because the block is here, which means anything down the way here, down the road is not being made and anything above me will accumulate. So what's gonna happen to my porphobilinogen? Uh, it's gonna go up and this is one of the porphyrins or it can be metabolized to more porphyrins. And that's why this is a porphyria. What are the exacerbating factors for acute intermittent porphyria? Look here, alcohol, anti-epileptics, barbiturates, tobacco, and more because they stimulate delta ALA synthase and they make tons of delta ALA, which means we'll make tons of porphobilinogen. But we cannot convert this porphobilinogen into the next step. So porphobilinogen, which is a porphyrin, will keep piling up and piling up and piling up. And this porphyrin in excess can be toxic to my body. Speaking of acute attacks of abdominal pain, autonomic dysfunction, neuropsychiatric issues, peripheral neuropathy and the purple urine. Porphyria means purple. You can download these colorful handwritten notes at medicosisperfectionalis.com which will help you understand and pass exams. Let's summarize everything about acute intermittent porphyria in one slide. Cause, inherited genetic mutation, autosomal dominant with low penetrance. What's the problem? I have deficiency in the porphobilinogen deaminase enzyme, which normally converts porphobilinogen into hydroxymethylbilane. Recall that the porphyros have what? Pyrrole rings, and pyrrole rings are communicating with one another with tons of nitrogens. When you remove the nitrogen, you are deaminating, deaminase. Let me deaminate the porphobilinogen. Porphobilinogen deaminase. Deficiency of this enzyme will make the porphobilinogen go up and the hydroxymethylbilane go down. Porphobilinogen goes up, it gets metabolized to other porphyrins, and before you know it, you have purple urine or wine color urine. I'm talking about red wine. Conjugation in organic chemistry make them vulnerable to the absorption of lots of beautiful, visible electromagnetic spectrum, deeply colored. Hey, medicosis, I took a patient's uh, urine sample. I'm pretty positive the patient has acute intermittent porphyria, but it's not purple. What should I do? Oxidize it. How do I oxidize the porphobilinogen? Light. Light will oxidize it. How come light oxidizes this? It's the process of conjugation because these are organic molecules that have conjugation thanks to their hybridized orbitals, and the conjugation makes them absorb and suck in electromagnetic light. Visible light will make them colorful. That's how light activates or oxidizes your porphyrinogen into porphyrin from urine color, which is normal, to the purple color, which is abnormal. Exacerbating factors, alcohol, tobacco, any cytochrome P450 inducer like anti-epileptics, barbiturates, progesterone can do it, fasting can do it, illness, surgery, stressful situations can trigger an attack of acute intermittent porphyria. And this is something important to listen to in the patient's history. Maybe King George got mad anytime he was stressed out because the enemies were at the gate. I'm just hypothesizing. I'm not a historian. I've no idea what the flip I'm talking about. Symptoms, acute intermittent attacks of abdominal pain, severe, autonomic dysfunction, I mean tachycardia, hypertension, sweating, neuropsychiatric issues, like psychosis, including hallucinations, and anxiety, which is exactly what happened to this poor patient. Peripheral neuropathy can happen as well. Don't forget the purple color of the urine. This disease does not have photosensitivity, unlike porphyria cutanea tarda, which did have photosensitivity, and congenital erythropoietic porphyria, which also had photosensitivity. Diagnosis, elevated level of porphobilinogen in the blood and the urine, increased ALA. Why? Because everything before the block will go up, porphobilinogen will go up, and the step before it, which is aminolivuronic acid, will also go up. Porphyrins, yeah, it's called porphyria for a reason. This is a doofus porphyrin, and it gets metabolized to more porphyrins. And because most of your biochemistry textbook takes place in the liver, I see elevated liver enzymes. 
and because cytochrome p450 is in the liver and we're talking about cytochrome p450 inducers of course they make your liver on fire literally with elevated alt and ast the transaminases or the amino transferases how can we manage this patient remember that glucose inhibited the enzyme delta ala synthase which means if you give glucose delta ala synthase will be inhibited and porphobilinogen will not even show up it will decrease which means we're decreasing the porphyrins. Problem solved. Also, you can give hemin. Why is this? Because acute intermittent porphyria is a block here, which means I cannot make him. So why don't you give me him? Yeah, give me hemin, which is a heme analog. I don't know if now or in the future, maybe they'll be able to just replace the porphobalanogen deaminase. That will be cool. Anytime your patient suffers from acute attack of severe abdominal pain, neuropsychiatric symptoms, autonomic dysfunction, neuropathy, and purple urine, please never, ever, ever, ever forget acute intermittent porphyria. You cannot treat your patients properly if you cannot diagnose them properly. So, study hard and watch my videos because I'll make you famous. Do you want to learn about angina, myocardial infarction, many arrhythmias, acute respiratory distress syndrome, hypothermia, drowning, and many other emergencies? Download my emergency medicine high yield course at medicosisperfectionalist.com. Acute intermittent porphyria can lead to tachycardia and hypertension. What are the medications that can lower my heart rate? What are the medications that can lower my blood pressure? To master your pharmacopoeia, download my cardiac pharmacology course at medicosisperfectionalist.com. As for neuropsychiatry, psychiatric issues, I have a neuropharmacology course also on my website. There are more than 1500 free videos on this channel, so please subscribe. And I have more than 300 premium videos available only to those who click the join button and choose the highest tier. Smash like, subscribe, hit the bell. Please support my channel on Patreon, PayPal, or Venmo. Go to my website to download my courses, notes, and cases, or if you'd like me to personally tutor you. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense.